is Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka. Only on the Blaze Radio Network. All right. Uh, wow, what, a, what an honor for me and a, and a real pleasure for me to be filling in for Opelka. My name's Yaron Brook, and I'll be with you the next uh, three days. Three days. So, uh, uh, Micah told me uh, you, you guys would treat me well. He, he warned me you can get a little rowdy. Uh, but uh, I welcome your calls and uh, welcome your participation. Let me, uh, I think I'll start by telling you a little bit about who I am because uh, pos- probably most of you have never heard of me. And um, uh, then a uh, lot to talk about, you know, uh, uh, Trump's uh, talk uh, speech last night about uh, – about Afghanistan and about coming together as one nation, always uh, interesting terminology. And then uh, we can talk more about foreign policy and state of our universities is going to be important uh, for me. But, but lots to talk about. No, no shortage of news out there on any given day that we can discuss. But let, let me start by telling you a little bit about me, a little bit about my ideas a little about where I come from, uh, ideologically, if you will, intellectually. And, and let me just say up front, disclaimer, please do not hold uh, Mike Opelka um, responsible for anything that I say. Only I am responsible for what I say. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say stuff that, that well, uh, you, know, you won't be happy with, he might not be happy with, who knows. So I'm, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Israel. I, I, uh, I lived most of my early life uh, in, uh, in the state of Israel. I, I emigrated. I'm an immigrant to the United States. My, my perspective on immigration might be a little different than yours and might be a little different than many of the hosts on the blaze because of my background, but not only because of my background, primarily because of my philosophical ideas and my view of what America stands for, what America really is. Uh, maybe the most formative event in in my life, really, certainly from an ideological, from a um, from an ideological perspective, was a book I read when I was sixteen. And let me tell you a little bit about what I was like when I was sixteen. Like most Israelis back then, I was a uh, a real socialist. I, I I really believed in the in the, in the state could solve all problems. I believed in egalitarianism and equality. Uh, I believe that the state was above all th- other things, and sacrificing for the state was one's most important duty. So I was kind of a nationalist and a socialist. That's a scary combination when I think of it today. Uh, but that's how we all were in Israel back then. This is in the uh, in the 1970s. We were raised on it. We were bred with it. Every all of our songs, all of our stories. I, our entire way of upbringing was focused on socialism. And nationalism, the, the the tribe, the Jewish tribe, and uh, and very much the state, the Israeli state, and then this idea of of, of socialism, of of sharing, of equality, equality of outcome, opportunity, equality, um, and um, very much part of how we were raised uh, in those days. And then I read a book, a book I think many of you have probably read, and if you haven't read, you've heard about, and if you've heard about it and haven't read. You should read, and if you haven't heard about it, I don't know where you're living. I don't know where you're living. Uh, the book is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It, it should be on everybody's reading list. Millions of people have already read it. I think it was, uh, it's a book that has already uh, been unbelievably influential and shaped much of American culture. And, and this book blew me away. And if you've read it, you know it, it, it's pretty it's pretty radical in, in a good sense. I, I use the term radical as, as consistent and, and, and positive and good. Um, many of you might have read it and, and not made much of it. Many of you might have read it and said, yeah, that's a kind of what I believe in. Uh, for me, it changed my life. It, it completely turned my life upside down. Everything I'd been taught, everything it turned out I, I believed in, anything, everything politically and philosophically that my parents believed in, that my neighbors believed in, that my favorite politicians believed in. She challenged. The book challenged. And uh, it, it, it completely, you know, radicalized me. It, 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 it completely changed me. 
it was the most important event in my life from an intellectual perspective. And, and I fought the book. I fought it. I, I know a lot, you know, you might have read it and say, yeah, I agree with that. I agree. No, I disagreed with everything. I did not want to agree with a word she said. I threw the book on the wall. I argued with her. Didn't help. Didn't help. She won. I lost. Uh, of course, I won overall. By the time I had finished the book, I was completely convinced and, and have been studying Ayn Rand's philosophy, Ayn Rand's ideas uh, ever since. Uh, I've, I've uh, really studied them uh, deeply. I've taken them to heart. I live these ideas. And everything you hear from me is my attempt, my attempt to convey to you Ayn Rand's philosophical ideas in the context of today's political, cultural environment. Uh, it, it's my attempt because who knows what she would have thought. She was a genius. I am not. But it's my attempt to, to take, you know, Donald Trump's speech from last night and give you an analysis based on these ideas. And, and, and let me tell you, you know, one of the most important things that Ayn Rand taught me and that I hope to help convey to you and, and what I hope I do every Sunday. I have a show every Sunday on The Blaze uh, from 2 to 4. You can always... You can also follow me on Facebook, on Twitter. Just plug my name in and, and uh, put my name in Google. YouTube, you can, you can uh, subscribe to my channel on YouTube and all the other fun social media stuff. I'm there, and you can, uh, you can, uh, you can participate. So if anything I say strikes you as interesting, uh, please, please uh, follow up on it. One of the things that I, I try to convey in all my speeches and all my talks and I speak, I, I, I think this last year, I gave 109 public lectures in, um, I think, over 30 countries. Uh, so uh, I travel a lot overseas and, and speak. Uh, some of my Sunday shows in the future are going to be from all kind of uh, bizarre international locations. So um, one of the most important ideas, or maybe you know, a key idea that really frames many of the other ideas, is that ideas – Deep philosophical ideas, ideas about the nature of the world, ideas about the nature of human beings, ideas about morality, ideas of what shape the world around us. It is philosophical ideas, philosophical ideas, philosophy, that subject that you hated in school. And we'll talk about that. It's good that you hated it in school because what you were taught for the most part was crap. But it's ideas that shape history, it's ideas that shape politics, it's ideas that shape the events that are happening all around us. And to some extent, I've always known that, but Ayn Rand really opened my eyes to that fact. And since then, I've been looking at the world and looking at current events, all from the perspective of trying to analyze, trying to figure out what are the fundamental ideas driving these trends driving what is happening in the world around us. And, and I think most of us, most of us are pretty upset by the state the world is in. I mean, we're about a, a little bit a week away from, over a week from Charlottesville. We have got a war in Afghanistan that has lasted uh, more than 16 years. Uh, we, we've got ISIS kind of on the run but still committing terrorist attacks like we saw just a few days ago in Barcelona. The world seems to be in disarray. Our universities, and we'll talk quite a bit, and if you follow me, we will talk quite a bit about the state of American universities, the horrific state of American universities and American education more broadly. Um, the state of the world is not good. And, and one of the things that I think explains some of the violence we're seeing in America, the, 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 the clashes inside this country, the rise of Donald Trump as president of the United States, something I think most of us, most of us thought was unthinkable a, a year or 18 months ago. All of this can really be explained by the ideas that are dominant in the culture and the inability, the inability of people to confront those ideas. So we'll be talking about 
this ideological, philosophical clash that is happening in the world around us. And what we need to do, those of us who believe in America, those of us who believe in freedom, those of us who believe in the founding principles of this country, what kind of ideas we need to embrace, what kind of ideas we need to study in order to protect this greatest of all countries, really in the history of mankind. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to the Michael Pelka Show, but this is Yaron Brook filling in. We'll be right back. Your network. Bye. You're listening to Pure Opelka with Mike Opelka on the Blaze Radio Network. Well, at least today, Mike's not here. He will be back on Friday. I'm filling in for the next uh, next three days. Uh, my name's Yaron Brook. And uh, we started uh, with a little bit of my personal history just because I think it, it relates to a lot of the things going on in the world today. You know, one of the things that, that happened to me when I read Atlas Shrugged uh, when, I was, when I was 16 is that I really, at the end of that novel, I committed myself to making it somehow to the United States of America. I committed myself to, to immigrating uh, to this great country. And uh, I was 16, you know, it, it not exactly, couldn't exactly make it uh, back then. And it took, me, it took me a decade to actually make it to the United States. But from that point in time, one of the things that kept going through my mind is I want to live in the freest country in the world. I want to live in a place that has the most opportunities to make the best life for myself as possible. I want to live in what is the greatest country on the planet, at least that is what I believed. Back then, to some extent, it's still true, although not quite as good as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as my uh, imagination uh, believed it to be, and not quite as good as, as America's potential is. We could be a lot better. We could be a lot better. Anyway, committed myself to doing that. Committed myself to finding a way to get into this country, to, to, to make it in. And, and, and this, is, this is why I sympathize so much with immigrants who come to this country. You know, they, they want a better life. Yeah, I wanted a better life. They want to make the most of their life as did I, and they want to find a way to come. And, of course, our immigration system is so screwed up. Don't even get me started on how screwed up our immigration system is. It's hard to find a legit way to get into this country. So, anyway, couldn't leave at 16. Couldn't leave at 18 because in Israel, some of you may know this, uh, there's a draft, and it, you get enlisted. And you go and serve three years in the Israeli army, whether you want to or not. And so I served in the Israeli army for three years, uh, spent some time in uh, Israeli military intelligence, learned a little bit about our enemies uh, in, uh, in the Muslim world, and uh, you know, still use some of what I learned way, way, way back then in, in, uh, in my analysis of, uh, of world events and my analysis of uh, kind of American foreign policy or the lack of it, or an Israeli foreign policy, and the lack of it, a kind of American and Israeli weakness. Um, got an undergraduate degree, because you had a, you know, the only really way I could figure out to get into this country was to go to school here. And, um, you know, uh, so I had to get a degree, got a degree in engineering. Seems like a, a, a previous life. I was a civil engineer, did construction work. That's so weird. Um, Anyway, came to the U.S. to get a graduate degree uh, in uh, an MBA and ultimately got a Ph.D. in finance. So I have a Ph.D. in finance. I was a finance professor for seven years. And then I was offered the job of running the Ayn Rand Institute, connecting back to reading Atlas Shrugged when I was 16. Now I got the job of actually being the advocate for her ideas out there in the world of, of creating an, of, of helping build up an institution dedicated to those ideas, to that philosophy. And I did that for, for 17 years. 
Um, today, I'm the executive chairman of that institution. Um, more doing things like I'm doing right now, speaking out there in the world on behalf of her ideas, on behalf of her philosophy. Um, so everything, everything I say is guided by those ideas. Those ideas I read about, you know, what is it? Uh, yeah, it's exactly, it's scary. I, I, you, you're going to figure out my age, but 40 years ago, exactly 40 years ago, summer of 1977 is when I read Atlas Shrugged, blew my mind, changed my life, changed my ideas. All right, uh, if you want in on the conversation on any topic we raise or anything else or anything from my biography or any, any issue that comes up in the news, uh, happy, happy to take your call, 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. Happy to hear from uh, you uh, Apelka fans. Oh, there's a term for you guys. I, I forget it now, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, happy to hear from you. Challenge me. Ask me questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to get into into the more controversial stuff here in a minute. So, came to America. One of the things that was interesting when I came to America is I came on an F1 visa, which was a student visa. One of the things they do with the student visa is they make it impossible for you to actually make a living while you're going to school. Because I came with no money. I came with two little suitcases with my wife. She came on an F2 visa. An F2 visa says you cannot work anywhere, anytime while you're on that visa. So what are you supposed to do as a student come here, right? Now, I could work on campus. So I got jobs. I got ends and, uh, odd and end kind of jobs where I could. But we struggled, and we struggled for no reason. My wife could have gone to work. But it would have been illegal. Two minutes. Illegal to actually work in the United States of America. That, that's a little strange. That would, would be uh, illegal to actually work. So... You know, just, just more illustration of how difficult we make it. We even make it difficult for people who come here to study, people who come here to get an education. And then once they get that education, we make it extraordinarily difficult for them to get a job. So uh, it, it's very difficult. Uh, and one of the big challenges we have in this country is the insane immigration laws. And unfortunately, Donald Trump and, and the latest immigration plan is not making that any easier. Uh, we, will, we will talk about that. Um, all right, so uh, we're coming up on a, on a break in, uh, in about a minute. We've got a couple of callers on the line, so please, Neil, Max, hold on. Uh, I'll get you right One after minute. the break. You, you both want to raise some big topics, so I need some you know, real time to actually uh, engage with them. Uh, and when we come back, I want to talk about why – the left is winning, and this really fits into Max's, uh, to Max's uh, ideas. Now, let me just say, the left is winning. Uh, even though Republicans hold the House, the Senate, and the presidency, these Republicans Ready? are far more leftist than Republicans were, you know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. Republicans have moved to the left. And the left, Democrats, have moved to the left. Leftist ideas, statist ideas, are Ten. gaining power in this country, uh, uh, increasing dramatically. Five, All right, four, we've got a hard break here. Three, and two, you're listening to Ron Brook filling in for Opelka. Right you're back. listening to Pure Opelka okay. with Mike Opelka on the Blaze Radio Network. On the Blaze Radio Network. All right, today you're getting pure Pelka from Yaron Brook, uh, but please don't hold Mike responsible for anything that I say. All right, we're gonna we're gonna be taking uh, we're gonna take some calls. We've got uh, we've got a bunch of callers. I knew as soon as I mentioned immigration, you know, people would want to call in. It's it's it seems to always be a hot topic. But our first caller wants to talk about. Communism versus capitalism. Uh, Neil, you're on uh, the Michael Pelka show. How's it going? Uh, uh, hey, hey, my, my, name, my name is Neil. It's, it's an honor to be on your show. Um, honestly, uh, 
I'm a big, huge fan of Ayn Rand. I've just gotten into her, and uh, honestly, uh, I've uh, I, and I also want. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> take a <laughs> deep breath. Doing... You're fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, um, <laughs> What's I, I wanted to ask this yeah. question. Uh, this, this, I was having this. Uh, this argument with uh, one of my friends who happens to uh, be a communist and really left-leaning is statist. And basically, uh, we, we were having this uh, conversation about uh, Ayn Rand, and basically, uh, of course, he of course he disagrees with her. But basically, he said that well, the reason why uh, Ayn Rand and uh, and, caps, and capitalism doesn't work is because, like, the Republicans have tried it time and time again, like, with yeah. the example of uh, yeah. Paul Ryan and T Ted Cruz. And I honestly disagreed with that, but honestly, I d didn't know how to, how, to ref how to refute that. So, Well, I mean, it's, I, it's, it's pretty simple to refute it. Look, what does capitalism mean? There's a big confusion out there because people pretend that America today is capitalist or that Paul Ryan believes in capitalism or that Ted Cruz even believes in capitalism, and they don't. They don't. And, and I know this might come as a shock to some of you out there, but they don't. Capitalism means the complete separation of state from economics. Capitalism means no state involvement in the economy. Capitalism means leaving us free. Free, un, which means unregulated, uncontrolled. Um, it means a government that does only one thing, Protect our individual rights, which means protect our freedoms, protect our freedom to act on our own behalf, uh, to, to start our own businesses, to sell our own things, to, to protect our property. So it's a system where all the property is privately owned and where the government's only job is to protect us. That's it. Arbitrate disputes. We need a legal system. But other than that, a government that leaves us alone. Now, you tell me, when in American history have we ever had that? Now, we came close close in parts of the 19th century, maybe between the Civil War and 1890 or, or, or something like that. We came close. But we've never really had it. Even during that period, the government was doing all kinds of nonsense, regulating railroads, uh, you know, controlling a lot of the land, uh, uh, taking over the canals and, 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 and taking them over for government control. So we've never really had pure capitalism, real capitalism in this country. Paul Ryan, who is, uh, who is a big proponent of the welfare state, he just wants to make the welfare state more efficient, is not pro-capitalist. And it's, it hasn't been tried in modern times. If you look at how many regulations there, millions and millions of different little regulations on every aspect of our business, uh, business lives, um, that's not capitalism. If you look at that tax code, the, the amount of taxes we pay, I pay in California, 55% of my income goes to the state, either to California, to federal government, 55%. That's not capitalism, that's socialism. So there is no capitalism in America today. We are a mixed mm -hmm. economy, mixture of some capitalism, not very much, and a lot of statism, a lot of socialism, a lot of government intervention in every aspect of our lives. So I, I agree. When they criticize right. Paul Ryan or they criticize Ted Cruz, fine. They're not criticizing capitalism. They're criticizing people who are mixed economy people who maybe are slightly less regulations, but they're not. They're not for real capitalism. They're not for the the the, the idea behind the founding of this country, which is freedom and individual rights, which is a government that leaves us alone, as Jefferson said, if if. Your neighbor doesn't have his hand in your pocket. What he does in his own home, in his own business, now I'm paraphrasing here, Jefferson, right, is none of your business. And yet it's all our business because the government intervenes in all of that. So when they attack Republicans, that is not attacking capitalism. Republicans are not the party of capitalism. I wish, I wish there was a party in the United States today that it was a party of capitalism. Indeed, what we need is an American capitalist party. Scrap these two loser parties, these two leftist parties, these two statist parties, these two parties that, that, that want to grow the state and, and increase its effect on our lives. 
I, I want to be, I, I want to be free. I want to be able to, to, to live my life without permission from some bureaucrat, without permission for some politicians. That's what this country is really about. So, you know, your friend is, is equating Republicans with capitalism. Huge mistake. And one of the things I try to emphasize over and over and over again is what capitalism really is. It's freedom. It's individual rights. It's a government that only, only, only protects us from crooks and criminals and fraudsters and terrorists and foreign invaders, arbitrates disputes and leaves us, us alone. And, of course, it doesn't even do those things very well today because it's so distracted by redistributing our wealth. So, um, uh, you know, when, when Republicans come out and say the solution of Medicare is to phase it out, and, and those of you who are Republicans who want to defend Medicare, call in, right? Let's, let me have it. When they say the solution of Medicare is to phase it out, the solution to Social Security is to phase it out, then we will know Republicans are capitalists. But you're not going to hear that, partially because America doesn't want capitalists. <laughs> so Republicans give us what we want, and America's way, way to the left of where it needs to be. Does that make sense, Neil? Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense. Got some and ammunition I, I to go back to your friend, and I, I don't know how you have a friend who's a communist. That 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 boggles my mind. So so the real question yeah. is, you have a friend who advocates for ideas that are responsible for the murder of over a hundred million people. I don't have friends who are communists. I I won't even. I mean, the only I will I won't talk to communists. I'll yell at them, but I can't talk to communists unless they're very young. <laughs> And I think they could still be swayed against it. But it's like having a friend who's a Nazi, in my view. Right? Nobody would admit to having a friend who's a Nazi. And yet, we treat communism as different. And in my view, communism and Nazism are the same thing. They both advocate the subjugation of the individual. They both are collectivist and place the group above the individual. And they both are responsible for death and destruction. Both believe in the use of force in order to achieve anything, in order to attain social goals. Both are the equivalent, and yet we somehow tolerate communism. And I, we'll get to it. I want to talk about why we tolerate communists uh, in a way that we would never tolerate Nazis. Uh, again, because we somehow, we're all lefties, and, and communism is the ultimate leftist ideology. All right, Neil, thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and, and we've got Max on the line who wants to talk about the rise and fall of America, which is a perfect topic for me. So uh, you're listening to the Iran, to Iran Brook on Opelka, and we'll be right back after this. Pure Opelka with Michael Pelka on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're in the last segment for, for the first hour, and this is Yaron Brook filling in for Michael Pelka. And um, Max dropped out. We were going to talk about the rise and fall of America. I was looking forward to that. Uh, Max, if you're uh, listening, call back. Uh, you know, I'd love to talk to you. All right, we're going to take, we're gonna take uh, Abbotton, who, who wants to talk about immigration. We're going to make this quick because... I don't really want to spend the rest of the, the show talking about immigration. We could talk for a long time. But uh, let's hear what Abbotton has to say. Since I raised the topic and I encouraged you guys to call. Hey, Abbotton. Hi, Aaron. Uh, hey, I want to run an idea by you. Uh, so one thing I've been thinking of is my family immigrated to the United States from Iran in the 70s and the 80s. My family and my extended family. Oh, then family. we should hate each I'm other. A... You're an Iranian and I'm an Israeli. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? <laughs> That's right. But, you know, in, in the time since we've immigrated, my family, I've been thinking about it, have probably created hundreds of millions of dollars in economic value here in the United States, yep. which means we've deprived Iran of that value that they would have created. And I think immigrants to the United States, we, we disproportionately select for people who are going to make something of their lives. That's why they come yep. to the United States. So isn't it both in our economic and our national security interest to encourage that brain drain, to encourage people from all over the world who want to make something of their lives to come here to – deprive our opponents of, of those resources and of those of that economic value so you're calling to get me in trouble with the blaze audience is that is that the goal that's the purpose 
<laughs> no, I, I thought that it would actually be a point that might resonate with I, that I mean, audience. I agree with you completely. Um, I agree with you completely. The, uh, the, the, our immigration policy should be much more open, much more favorable towards people who can come here to work. We should, I mean, my ideal immigration program, given the fact that we're in a mixed economy, given the fact that there's a lot of welfare, and given the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're messed up uh, in so many respects, uh, my ideal immigration program would have anybody who can get here, who, who will work, uh, can come in. And look, my argument about immigration is not about economics. I, I can make the economic argument. I think immigration is great for America, partially because of what Abatin uh, said, you know, you, you, immigrants who come to this country work, produce, uh, they're entrepreneurial, they create, they build, whether it's a low skill level or at a very, very high skill level, uh, the more immigrants, the better who are willing to work for a living. I, I believe in that. I, I think anybody working is creating value. Uh, it, work is win win. Immigration is win win if, uh, y you know, they're coming here to work. And that would be my entire focus. Let as many people who want to come to this country come as long as they're willing to work, and we would get the best, the best people in the world. That's who we would get, right? The, 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 uh, the, the, the most entrepreneurial, the smartest, the most ambitious uh, people in the world would come here, again, whether high-skilled or low-skilled. And uh, they would improve their own lives, and they would improve, improve our economy. But beyond that... I, as an American, have an individual right to invite anybody I want into this country as long as my inviting them does not physically harm my neighbor or any other American. So as long as I'm not inviting into this country a terrorist, a criminal, or somebody carrying an infectious disease, why is it any of your business? Who comes to work for me? Who comes to visit me? Who comes to stay in my hotel? So our immigration policies are violating the individual rights of Americans. That's what I have against them. Right? The economic argument is, is an invalid argument, the idea that, that, oh, you hurt wages in America. First of all, you don't have a right to a wage. You don't have a right to a job. You don't have a right to health care. You don't have a right to other people's stuff. The only right you have is to be left alone, left free, protected. That's it. You have a right to be protected from physical force used against you. Not protected in terms of your salary. Not protected even in terms of your economic opportunities. Those are your responsibilities. All the government is there to protect you from is the use of physical force by terrorists, by criminals, by the government itself. That's it. So there is no, econ right. there is no economic argument against uh, immigration. Add to that the fact that, you know, by any measure, immigration is a huge benefit to them, to the economy, qua economy, in terms of, again, entrepreneurship, in terms of anybody who has a job is creating value. Win-win relationships. I'm, I'm paying you Two because, minutes. you know, I gain from it and, 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 uh, you're creating value, you, you go and shop, you, you're creating economic activity from an economic perspective. You can run the models, you can run the, you, you can study economics and you will find an argument against immigration in the economics literature. It just doesn't exist. Uh, freer, opener borders are better economically, much better economically than closed borders, but I believe in the argument from the rights perspective, from individual rights. Right, and the... Yeah. I agree completely. But in, in the in the pursuit of our rights, wouldn't, wouldn't there be an argument for the government to actually go out of its way to find people who, who would be productive in America? No, because it's not the government's job. Adversaries. It's not the government's job to do that. It's not the government's job to encourage people to immigrate. It's not the government's job One minute. to go out and find people. It's the government's job to protect us. And it needs to screen the people coming in to make sure that they're not criminals or terrorists or carrying infectious diseases. But other than that... You know, if they've got, again, in, in the current environment, if they've got a job, why stop them from coming in? Uh, the government has no role in, in going out there and deciding we need these professions versus those professions like, they, like Trump's current plan, right? That's central planning. Since when did the government know 30. what the economy needed? The government's pathetic when it comes to things like that. 
it has no clue what kind of jobs are needed in America and what kind of jobs are not needed in America. If you have a job, that's all the government should require. And it, as long as you're not a danger, then they should allow you in. Ten. All right, you're listening to Iran Book Show. We will get to you, Max, Five, I promise, four, right after this three, break. Two, you're listening to one. Blaze Radio Network.